Can you hear me now? Yay! Well, those aren't scuba divers. That's what I was saying. Those are animals that can do it on their own. We have to pretend to be like the animals in order to dive. Well, this is our Aquarium Online Academy's Science of Scuba Diving. We're going to be learning about how we can do like the animals do out in the ocean and get into the water for long periods of time. So during this class, you can participate. You can ask us questions via our text line if you're watching live at Friday at 10 a.m. If you're not watching live, you can still email us questions at live at lbaop.org and we'll have our educators help answer your questions. Well, let's think about diving and how we have to do it and how they get to do it so easily. Let's make some observations of the animals. How do animals get to dive through the water so well? What different adaptations do you know of that these animals might have? Stingray! Our spotted eagle rays are getting quite large. When we first got them, I think they were maybe a third of that size. They're pretty big now. But the rays and the bony fish and the shark, they have very different ways of being able to survive different depths and different adaptations to be able to do that. But they're also extremely different from us in one particular way, how they control body temperature. How do we control body temperature? Well, I mean, I'm wearing a vest this morning. It was a little cooler on my walk to work. So I wear, or we all would wear clothes that would help with the weather we're in. If it's too cold outside, we might wear extra. If it's too hot, we wear less. Hmm, do the fish do that? Do fish need jackets? I've heard of a penguin wearing a jacket, but not a fish. Well, what's going on with their bodies? They are all cold-blooded, meaning the temperature of the environment is their temperature. Now, there's a temperature range that they can survive in, and that's okay. They're adapted to those temperatures. But our bodies have to stay the same temperature all the time. So if we're in water that's too cold for too long, we get hypothermia. If you have a fever for too long, too high of a fever, it starts to make you even more sick. So our bodies have to stay in this one narrow range of temperature all the time. And if it's different from that, we can't really do well in that environment. So when we go diving, depending on the water temperature, we have to do things to our body to help protect them. Well, that's what other mammals do too. Seals and sea lions and whales all have blubber to protect their body. It's like wearing a jacket on the inside. Let's take a look at one of those marine mammals and take a little bit closer look as to how they are surviving in the ocean too. Because they naturally have abilities to dive and hang out with the fish. We have to use technology to mimic them. So when they're in the water, they have a short layer of fur. They also have a blubber layer on the inside. That special fat layer, like on a walrus too, helps protect the body heat of that animal. Now, sometimes seals and sea lions will be seen hauling out, or sea lions actually stick their flippers out of the water like they're waving, and they're just trying to warm up parts of their body. So when they stick their flippers out, they're just warming up part of their body and before they go diving again. Well, how do we use this technology? How do we protect our body heat in the ocean? What's pulling our diver friend to talk about dive technology? They're very quiet. They don't need a microphone. They can't forget to turn it on either. So we have to use wetsuits to protect our bodies. Now, our divers, when they're in the water, they wear a full set of wetsuit, hood, gloves, boots, full wetsuit. And that's more to protect their bodies from getting cuts or scrapes when they're in the water and from the animals bumping into them and doing anything to them too. So even though this is a tropical habitat, our divers will be in a full set of wetsuit gear. A lot of people that when they're diving in a tropical environment, they may wear less dive equipment, less wetsuit, because the temperature is warm enough they don't have to worry about protecting their body temperature. But you can wear a full hood. There's different kinds of wetsuits for what you want. You can get suits that are like a spring suit where it's got short sleeves and sh short legs. There's different thicknesses you can use. And then the thickness is measured in mils millimeters so that if it's a higher number there's more insulation. Wet suits 
are literally what they are. You will get wet on the inside. But that wet layer inside is warmed up by your body. So just like the air inside our jackets is warmed up by our body heat, and then that pro uh, provides a layer of insulation against the cold outside, we have water that does the same thing inside a wetsuit. So that's one way that we've been mimicking how mammals in the ocean are doing this naturally. We can't do the same thing that a fish does. We can't be cold-blooded. So we have to use other things to help protect our bodies. Well, what else can these fish do? Or even sometimes we're hypoth hypothesizing that mammals are doing this too, that we might need to use to protect ourselves. If you're diving, you aren't totally floating and you aren't totally sinking, at least for most of it. If you sink too much, you, you probably aren't going to have the best time diving. But you don't want to be right at the surface right here either, because that doesn't really help. You can just snorkel with that. You are going to want to actually get down in the middle of the water if you're going to start diving. So we have different things on our dive equipment to mimic what the animals do. This is a buoyancy control device, or BCD. These bony fish in here have an internal one. These fish actually have a swim bladder. It's an organ that they can inflate to help create more buoyancy or deflate to help sink. So that's one way that we're copying the fish instead of the mammals. Now, when I said scientists are hypothesizing that the whales are doing some of this, is that we don't entirely know what's going on inside of a whale while it's diving. But they dive to some impressive depths. Sperm whales can get down to about 6,000 feet without harming their bodies. And in a pretty quick amount of time, when we take submarines down to that depth, we have to make sure that we're not diving too fast or rising too, too, too quickly so that we don't damage the equipment, but also we don't hurt the people. Even though they're inside the submarine, the compression factor is really important. So there is a limitation as to how far down our, a human might be able to dive with just a wetsuit or, or a free, free diving without a suit at all. But even in a submarine, there's limitations to what a person inside that vessel has. So a buoyancy control device helps keep you what's called neutrally buoyant. So just like this fish is not going up or down, just hanging out with the kelp, your BCD can help with that. It also ends up being like a reserve with some emergency air if you need an extra breath or two of air if you're on your way up because something's happened to your air supply. Which is kind of important for the next part of what we need to tell you about. Air. Fish. Those lucky animals, they can breathe while they're underwater without having to worry about running out of air. We have to take air with us. We can't really practice to dive as long as some mammals. Like that sperm whale that dives up to 6,000 feet can also dive for up to two hours. Don't think you can hold your breath as long as a sperm whale. So we have to use other technology that will help while we're down there. So air tanks can be made of different materials, not plastic. This is only a display bottle. But the different kinds of metal will also change your buoyancy, but create different pressure amounts that you can use inside that tank. So they're pressurized with air. The same stuff we're breathing right now. Not the stuff that you might think of where it's just pure oxygen. You can actually get too much oxygen. That's a thing. Think of somebody that's hyperventilating. They're breathing in and out too fast. They're actually changing the chemistry of their blood because they're inhaling too much oxygen. So hyperventilating, hyperventilating is bad. Breathing pure oxygen is not good for you. So this is just going to contain the same stuff the atmosphere has, but compressed so it can fit more air into that, like this person's doing. This is our friend Dana. Now Dana's also holding a gauge to help monitor what's going on. You can have your pressure gauge, and in some cases, they, some divers have uh, depth gauges into some of these things too, and your pressure gauge will tell you how much air you have left. They're measuring it in just terms of the PSI that's left inside. So like on this one, it just measures up to, I know you can't quite read it, 5,000 PSI, and then it has at about 1,200, 1,300, gets into the orange zone. That means you don't have a lot left. You need to start surfacing now. So when you're underwater and you're breathing, the respirator is delivering the air from your tank to your face. And it works in a special way. Take a look at the respirator. 
So it does fit in your mouth, and it is for breathing. And some of the practice people have to do when they start diving is getting used to not using your nose to breathe at all. You're using your mouth. And even if something happens, like if you get water inside your mouth, you can force it out of your respirator. So it has a valve to allow air to come out, but not stuff to come back in. It's pretty neat stuff. Whales and dolphins just have different amounts of red blood cells in their body. They have different adaptations for how long they can dive and how far down they can dive. Dolphins actually don't dive for very long. It's minutes at a time rather than half hours or hours at a time. The big whales are diving for long periods, but they have to hold their breath, and they have special adaptations to hold their breath for a very long period. I think some of the longest records of people diving with one breath of air is, I think it's over 10 minutes on a free dive. Those are people are doing like the extreme diving as far down as they can get in a bathing suit and a pair of flippers and come back up. The average person is not going to be able to do that. But people are pushing the limits of what the body is able to do. So we're, instead of mimicking anything with our wetsuits, we're just taking technology down with us to allow us to do the normal thing up top that we need to do underwater. So that's how we take care of our air. Well, what else can we do or do we need to do while we're in the water? Are we just walking around, clomping on the ground? You just dive in, fall straight to the seafloor, boom, and you just kind of like, ah, 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 ah. no, there's a lot more to it. You're going to need to swim, and you're going to need flippers for that. There's different kinds of flippers, too. You can't see this person's flippers because of where the angle is on the picture, but divers are using them. Now, except when like our divers get into exhibits like this, they don't actually have to swim very much. They may not use flippers, but if you're diving out in the ocean, you're going to need flippers to be able to move around. All of the equipment that you would see on a person, so if Sherwood had all of the actual equipment, real metal tank, all this stuff walking around, this could be 40 to 60 pounds of gear. So when you're in the water, you're going to need some extra oomph to move around with. And for many divers, they're just using their fins. There's different kinds for different things. So some dive fins can be really long, so there's a lot more surface area to get their feet more power to swim around with. A lot of our divers, when they do wear fins in our exhibits, are using split toe fins. They don't need as much oomph to move around, and they don't need as much speed if they're swimming around, but also it helps they're a little more flexible. So if they do have to move and get around and cleaning rocks and feeding the animals, the split toe fins help a little bit with that. And then there's just average length fins like you might see a snorkeler using, or really short fins that you might see snorkelers using, because again, you won't need as much swim power, because if you're snorkeling, you're just kind of floating and staring at the animals. But if you're diving, you're probably having to move around to specific areas. You have to surface or dive farther down, depending on what's going on. So you're going to need that extra power to swim around with your fins on. Now, the cool thing is, what if you don't have feet for fins? Well, there's been more things happening with dive technology. You can actually get gloves that are webbed, so you can use more hand power to swim with. But also, there's power devices that have little motors that you can hold on to, and they will take you where you need to go. So there's some dive technology that's helping people who don't have all four limbs in normal working order dive in the ocean. You can do tandem diving, where they're actually together, like a tandem skydive. So there's lots of things that people are doing and figuring out how to change the technology so that more people have the access to diving in the ocean. Well, now you have all of your air your ability to swim around, stay warm. You gotta be able to see stuff on your down there too. Now in the history of diving, dive equipment has changed a lot in the last 2,400 years. Yes, that is correct. Some of the first diving bells were described in the fourth century BC. That's a long time ago. So we've been putting people into things underwater than just hanging out for a few minutes. Now a dive bell is literally, there's an object that sits on top of you that holds on air. So imagine if you had a cup, an empty cup, and you wanted to put it upside down into a tub of water, and you could force it down, there's an air pocket that stays inside. That's what diving bells were. People would be able to breathe in this pocket of air, 
and sometimes they have little tiny windows that they could stare out of, but you only have that space for a few minutes. Well, then they figured out that they could supply air to people. In, I think, the 1600s, they could supply air in a big suit type of thing. But then we figured out how to do more open diving with something like this. Now, this is an actual dive helmet from the days of yore. Now, the first kinds of these equipment came around in the 1800s, and then they were most famous, if you've been watching any movies, in World War One and Two, where divers were out rescuing people from sunken vessels and recovering sunken equipment. So they would be in a helmet like this, with this very fancy window to look out of, and that was it. That's all the, all the equipment on their head that they had. You would have airlines that would supply your air to you. And you had somebody up top either running a generator or a crank or something to help pump air into your suit. They didn't have the insulation that we do back then. So it was very cold usually when you're doing these dives. And these suits were extremely heavy. So you had to be a very strong person to be able to move around. And that's back when you didn't have fins for diving. You just literally fell in to the ground and clomped around as a diver. But now we have a lot of different technology you can see on Sherwood to help improve that. And back in the 60s and 70s, the masks that people used were also very different. Sherman's a little tall. I'll dangle these down a little bit. Goggles have come a long way just in the last 40 years. Now, goggles can be, uh, have prescriptions, they're all plastic, so if, even if you wear glasses, you can still see what's going on down there. They have uh, adjustable straps and other things that can help with you being able to see stuff. You might have seen some pictures of one of the most, or more famous, diving entrepreneurs, Jacques Cousteau, and has just this one big glass oval. Actually, there's still divers that still use that because they prefer it, has a lot of visibility. So. Take a look at some divers with goggles and things. <laughs> so goggles can also have lots of different colors. You can actually personalize it to the way you want it to be. I personally have a, just a pair of black goggles, but some people want special colors. Some people uh, want extra windows on the sides so they can have a little bit more range of visibility. So there's a lot of advances and changes that have happened for us to be able to see underwater. Now, even though the ocean salinity is similar to our eyes, there's lots of other stuff in the ocean you don't want in your eyeballs, so we need that set of goggles. Also, when you're diving into depths, the pressure will start to affect your body. So you're going to want those goggles to help as you get deeper in the water to make sure that you can still see everything. Let's talk more about the pressure. So we, we said people used to go underwater in these giant contraptions. We advanced into different kinds of suits. We now have modern wetsuits. But the pressure is still very important to think about. Because how fast you dive can affect your body. Air is supposed to stay in our lungs. Oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, in and out. It's not supposed to go anywhere else. But when you compress things, those gases can start seeping into your blood vessels. So when you hear somebody call or says they have the bends, that's called a nitrogen narcosis. And that nitrogen is moving around and it usually collects in our joints. So it's really painful and that, that gas will collect in people's joints. Now it can eventually take care of itself if it's not a very bad case of nitrogen narcosis. But in some cases people have to go to a pressure chamber to recreate the pressure that was on their body so the nitrogen will come back out of their joints, out of their blood, and they can expel it through their, their lungs again. So they will compress the body to the same pressures that they started to experience, the, the nitrogen narcosis, or uh, pressure that will actually start to fix the problem. And a lot of divers have to do this. And it's actually an emergency case where divers will be taken to Catalina Island. I think that's one of the... I don't know where the next nearest dive chamber would be, but that's the closest one around here where people that have uh, been injured while diving or have a nitrogen narcosis case, they will get taken to that site, put into the chamber for the prescribed amount of time at the prescribed amount of pressure and monitored to help make sure that they can 
get healthy from that because it can be extremely painful. It can also be uh, potentially deadly if you have a bad enough case of nitrogen narcosis. So if you dive too fast or if you surface too fast, you can get the bends. Now that BCD, that buoyancy control vest, the buoyancy control device, that can help with your dive speeds. So you and your dive buddy, because you always need a dive buddy, will be monitoring each other. You're there for each other to make sure nothing happens. So if you have to surface, you will communicate with them. If you, have, if you want to dive to a different depth, or if you want to go around to a different area, you have to communicate with your dive buddies so that everybody knows where you're going. But how do you do that? How do you communicate? Because you can't really talk underwater in this material. They have a form of sign language that they use so that they can signal to each other to make sure that they can, if they need to suddenly surface because something's wrong or if they need to uh, ask a basic question like, are you okay? Or where is Steve? You can kind of ask these questions to your partner and you can help communicate while you're underwater. Now, the next cool thing about communication underwater is that here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, we use masks that are full face masks like firefighters use with a microphone in it. So when our divers are in the water, if they're going to do a dive presentation, they can actually talk to the people outside of the exhibit. So here's that full, uh, full face mask. Now, the military also uses something similar where they can communicate underwater while they're diving. But this full mask is more like a firefighter's mask so that this line is their electric line to their microphone, not an air line. And then they can talk to people on the outside. So that's kind of the cool thing is that there is dive technology that now you could talk to other people, but real, real words, not using just hand signals to communicate to other people out there. So you can see how this mask is very different from a standard face mask. Now, when we talk to our divers that are using these masks, sometimes just adjusting the mask a little bit will change how the microphone picks up. So it's a very small, very nice microphone like mine is to help just pick up what they're saying. But if it's just pointed in the wrong direction, you can't quite hear what they're talking about. All right, let's go back to, well, actually, let's go to our Blue Cavern exhibit where it's very common to see our divers hanging out. Now, currently, our divers are not doing any dive presentations, but they do still get in the water to feed and take care of the exhibits. So if you're ever watching our live webcams, you might have a chance to check out if there's any divers inside. You can also rewind the webcam so you can try and look for when the divers are inside too. So Blue Cavern is our tallest exhibit. I think Stacy's actually looking. I don't know when the divers actually get in to feed or clean. Their schedule is, is not what it used to be, and that's okay. But this is our tallest exhibit at about 27 feet deep. That is almost the kind of special number that we have for an additional atmosphere of pressure. So we're talking about pressure and diving too fast or too slow. About 30 to 33 feet is one atmosphere of pressure. So when, if you're standing at the beach, waterline, imagine there's a column straight above your head, or just your, your size of you. All of that air in that column is pushing on you. That's one atmosphere of pressure. And that's miles of that air column pushing down on you. But 33 feet of water creates one additional atmosphere of pressure. So that is a lot of pressure. So think of those divers that are going to 100 feet deep. Well, in total, that's four atmospheres. That's three in the water, one from the air. What about those machines that go down 4,000 feet? That's a lot of pressure on the equipment or on the, the person. So the actual person, I don't think people can dive uh, for long periods of time without a hard suit from at more than 300 feet of depth because the pressure is just too much for the body to handle. So hard suits, it looks like those big old robot things from the 1960s monster movies, right? Hard suits were developed so that they, a single person could be diving to extreme depth. Takes a lot of time and a lot of equipment and a lot of practice to be able to use those. 
So as technology changed, we also started using less people. We can use remote operated vehicles. We can use automated vehicles where you program it to go do a trip, put it in the water, goes and collects all of its temperature samples or water samples, comes back up, and you go pick it up. So to help protect the people, because pressure can be an extremely dangerous thing, we're also using more robots and technology and less people in the water to help protect that person. Now, how would you want to become a diver is a good question. If you wanted to learn how to dive, you got to take classes. And it's not just going in and learning about diving. Once you know your rules of diving, how to communicate while diving, you have to take tests too. So if you don't like tests, that's too, that's too bad. If you want to dive, you have to be able to take the tests. But then you have to do your swim tests. They want to make sure that you can swim underwater. They want to make sure that you can swim with your equipment on and then solve problems while you're down there. Being underwater can actually be pretty dangerous. What happens if your buoyancy control device gets a leak? What happens if your air tank suddenly runs out of air or your respirator flies out? Doing all these things, you have to be able to problem solve and operate underwater calmly and to be able to make sure that you are safe and that you and your dive buddy can work together to make sure that you are safe and get you back to the surface without giving yourself nitrogen narcosis. So being a diver is very rewarding. There's a lot of fun things that you can go do. There's a lot of great dive spots in Southern California. Like this is an actual dive site, Blue Cavern. We uh, modeled the actual dive site here at the Aquarium Pacific with our Honda Blue Cavern exhibit. But Blue Cavern at the island of Catalina is an extremely popular spot for divers and uh, conservation enthusiasts to go check out because of it's a protected area. So there's a lot of things going on in the real dive spot and a lot of special things that you can see out there. Divers are help, helping to catalog fish. Why would they want to count the fish? Well, the three that are important are not visible here. These are the giant sea bass. Giant sea bass live here in Southern California. Like these, these frowny footballs right here. Divers are in the water photographing and cataloging when they see these animals because they're a protected species. They were in, uh, I think they still are endangered. I think they're still classified as endangered. So scientists are helping to monitor the population of fish, invertebrates, and a whole bunch of other things. Our divers participate with the white abalone project and they will go out and do a census and count white abalone. These things. They're not the easiest to spot out in the ocean too because when they're out there, they are covered with stuff, algae, sand, a whole bunch of things. So it can be kind of tough to find them, but divers are out there helping to monitor endangered species. So you can do it recreationally. You can get a scientific diver certification, which takes more classes. It's not just a check mark and you get, okay, you got that. You have to take more classes because you have to learn how to do more things when you're a diver. Now our volunteer divers here have 50 logged open water dives and they have the level three certification. So they have open water, advanced and their first aid diving certification. So that way, if something happens, they can help perform the medical care, immediate medical care needed if somebody's injured or passes out or something happens in the water, which thankfully has never happened here. And our divers do run drills. So every once in a while, our dive team has to get into the exhibits with our actual exhibits and our actual divers to pretend that they're injured and have somebody practice saving them. So there's a lot that goes on here for our divers. So if you're interested in volunteer diving, make sure you have those 50 dives, level three certification, and then you can check out our website about applying to become a volunteer diver here. Now, during this part of the year, we are not taking too many volunteer divers right now because we just don't have as much need for volunteer divers, but often during our summers, or normal summer anyways, we would beef up our numbers because we will need more help with our volunteer staff here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Well, that's a lot of dive information for one day, my friends. I hope you enjoyed learning about the history of diving, some of the technology of diving, and how we are copying some of the animals to be able to go have fun in the ocean, just like they get to do every day. We'll see you next week on our Aquarium Online Academy. If you have more questions, feel free to email us at live at lbaop.org.